I didn't know if I would come out of the hospital alive. That's how scary it was. Hey, Radhika. See ya. Dear Radhika, in just 63 days, this is going to be your new home. I hope I get to show it to you. Look how beautiful this is. My favorite places and all my favorite people. You see, you're arriving at a very difficult time. The number of people killed worldwide in the coronavirus pandemic has now passed 250,000. People are dying. I can't breathe without this. <laughs> the world is at war. People on the front lines aren't soldiers. The thanks for key workers are prospered. The people like your dad and people like me. So I'm leaving you this message just in case. The world was moved and so moved when this video first went viral online. A mother's message for her then unborn daughter, just in case she died. For Meenal Viz, a doctor at the front line in the United Kingdom, that was a very real fear. The young Indian origin doctor, along with her husband, then basically took her fight to Downing Street and also legally challenged the United Kingdom's policy on providing safety protection to healthcare workers, especially shining a light on the challenges for pregnant women who were at the front line of the COVID battle. As the UK goes into a severe lockdown again, on We The Women's Conversation for Change, where we showcase the female voice, it is my pleasure to welcome to the program, Dr. Venal Viz, who now, of course, uh, has had her baby. We can see her little one, Radhika, there uh, in her arms. And it's been a momentous, momentous year, but everything ended happily. Uh, and that's that's a lovely little daughter you have there, Amina. <laughs> welcome to the show. Uh, before Radhika was born, and before there was a happy ending, there was that powerful picture of you standing alone in front of 10 Downing Street, talking about what pregnant women like yourselves at the front line of the COVID battle were having to go through. You were triggered, of course, by the death of, a, of another uh, pregnant young woman who was at the front line. Uh, and, and, and you basically said no one was paying attention to what they needed to pay attention to. Let's start with what this year has been like for you. Uh, as a woman at the front line, a healthcare worker at the front line, a young mother at the front line, a pregnant woman at the front line. Well, firstly, I want to say thank you so much for having me, Bharga. I want to thank you as well for the incredible work that you've done this year as well to amplify the voices of those who, who really needed it the most. So, so thank you for all your efforts this year. Um, so much. To, so to answer your question, Bharga, it, it's very difficult for, for me to, to cut it down, but it has been a very tough year. Uh, we were working in emer the emergency department, my husband and I, uh, early in early March last year. We saw how the virus was spreading throughout the world and we, we kind of we had an idea of what would happen to our country if, if we weren't being protected. And the only thing we wanted, Barca, was to protect the British public and to protect those who were coming through the hospital uh, doors. We could only do that if we were protected. And my husband was was working in, in A&E at the time in the emergency department. And he started to see, well, first we were told to wear the full protective gear. Then the next day we were told to wear a, a flimsy apron. How is that? How is that? Does that make any sense? And then when we started to read into it, we realized, well, we don't have enough protective gear. This is why the guidelines were changing. So it was actually based on supply rather than the science. And this was very dangerous. People were dying as a result of it. I remember I was sitting at home one day and I, I, put, I put the news on and I saw the first healthcare worker had died. 
and they were from an ethnic minority group. And I thought, hold on, this is the first death. What happens if another person dies? Do, we, do I just sit here and continue to watch this happen? I was heavily pregnant at the time, Barker. I was also working in the emergency department. I was worried about what would happen to me or to, to Radhika as well. And I, I was suffering from very severe pregnancy sickness. I remember driving to work and pulling on the roadside just to be sick every 10 minutes because I, I just couldn't I just couldn't hack it. And I, I thought to myself, well, if he was the first person who died, imagine the grief that's hit this family. What if it happens to other families? And it did bring me a lot of stress that we were in a pandemic, I was pregnant, I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. I didn't know if I would come out of the hospital alive. That's how scary it was. My husband and I were living on separate floors at the time in our house because we wanted to make sure that we didn't pass anything onto each other. Yeah, so basically, Basically, at that point, as a six month pregnant doctor uh, at the front line, you were all alone in that pregnancy because it wasn't even that typical support that your husband would normally have been able to provide you because you couldn't risk infecting each other and therefore Radhika. That's right, Burka. It was a very lonely time uh, and I was I was scared. I was anxious. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what the next few months had in store for us, but I had to channel that energy into something positive. I thought if I sit back and watch this happen, then that would that would probably make me more anxious. But I need to do something about it. And it was the the death of, of Nurse Mary Adjipong, as you had mentioned. She was working in in my husband's hospital. Now Nurse Mary had come from Ghana, and she's also from an ethnic minority group, and she's pregnant. So for her, she was vulnerable in in many many forms. When my husband came back from, he probably had done about three or four night shifts in a row. He walked through the door and I could see in his face and I said, Nishant, what's wrong? And he said, Neil, you won't believe what I'm about to tell you. And he told me what had happened. And this nurse had passed away. And the most heartbreaking part of that for me, Barker, was that it could have been prevented. That didn't have to happen. When you look back at all these healthcare workers who have died, it didn't have to be that way. They could have been saved. And Nurse Mary had to deliver her child via emergency C-section she never got to hold her baby yeah i'm sat here right now talking to you with radhika in my arms and it's it's a blessing for me i'm very grateful and yes we talk about our duties and responsibilities as doctors in the hospital and you talk about furs and the kind of role we play in society but actually it doesn't just stop at the hospital it goes beyond the hospital walls and that's what made me go out and protest yeah. And as you hold Radhika today in your arms, I'm sure you think every single day of Mary, whose baby was born and she never even got to have that one moment with her child. <laughs> Bless you, Radhika. Um, you're right. Uh, there is a sense of, of guilt, Barka, that I, I think about every day. And in fact, I delivered Radhika in the same hospital where Mary um, had passed away and delivered her child via emergency C-section. So the day I went to to go for, for my, my, my delivery, I was just sat there thinking, well, Mary was in the same ward. She was in the same hospital. Will I be treated differently as well because of my skin color? Will I be treated differently because of, of the name I have? Will Radhika be treated differently in the future? And when Radhika was born, Barka, she they gave Radhika and they said, look, this is this is your, your, your daughter. And I had tears in my eyes. And, and yes, it was because I was happy and I was relieved that it was all over, that we were both safe. But there was also a sense of, well, Mary never got a chance to do this. Her yeah. child will never see her mother. And Mary also left behind a three-year-old little boy Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, but you know, I'm so happy to see Radhika there in your in your arms. I do want you to talk a little bit about the class, uh, the the race, the ethnic dimension to this battle, right? Uh, and I ask you this because even here in India, you know, everybody called the virus the great equalizer in the beginning. But as we went along, we actually saw that the virus impacted you very differently 
if you were poor, if you were on the margins of society, if you were disempowered in other ways. And I think one of the things that you have shone a light on uh, is the fact that there needs to be a special focus on those who are from an ethnic minority, who those who might be uh, at the margins of, of, of mainstream attention. So can you speak a little bit about that and also your experience as a young doctor of uh, Indian origin, as a woman of color uh, in the United Kingdom? Sure. So, Barka, we we started to realize the realities of, of the virus as, as the weeks went on. We started to see how more ethnic minority groups were affected. But it shouldn't have come to a surprise, right? We have known this for a very, very long time, especially here in the UK. We know that a woman is five times more likely to die, a black woman is five times more likely to die during childbirth than a white woman. We've known this for years and for decades, but nothing has been done. So we have to go to the, to, to the question and say, where does this actually stem from? And you start to, to realize that the NHS, the system that we work in, there are systemic inequalities. There are disparities that haven't been tackled. And the fact that our leaders have chosen not to act on it, all they say is we will do surveys, we will look into it, we will put, and they put out plenty of reports, Barka. They're very good at putting reports out. But when the action is needed, they're not doing anything. And this yeah. is this, this yeah. is part of our legal challenge, Burka, that we wanted to make sure that any of our colleagues who come from India, especially, you know, they, they leave their, their family to come for what, what they think is a better life here. So can you imagine that they come here and they think, well, nobody actually really cares about us. No one is asking us how we can be protected. Hey. So one of our, our biggest things that we have achieved this year with our legal challenge is that we've made sure that all ethnic minority hey. groups have a very specific risk assessment before they are put in the COVID ward. That's fantastic. But can you also speak to the uh, gender fault line? And let me share uh, some of the experiences I had while traveling across India, literally uh, to the eye of the pandemic. Uh, there was a pregnant doctor that I met uh, in a COVID hospital uh, who actually miscarried. She was pregnant when she was at the front line and she miscarried and you know she was traumatized and she was so traumatized that she she mentioned it on camera as something that had happened to her friend and later when the camera was off she said actually i've told you my story in another hospital i met a nurse and she spoke to me about what it felt to her to bleed in a ppe to get a period in a ppe and she said the ppe had just whoever had made this ppe had just not even thought of the female body uh, and in any case you feel asphyxiated when you're wearing the full ppe which is why the number of hours on the shift are, are, are fewer than normal shifts it's in non-COVID times, right? And she spoke about how she would feel faint, the smell of plastic. It would have, it would trigger in, in, in very sort of bodily ways. So I, I, I'm wondering, you know, has there been enough thought? Because many pregnant women have continued to work through this. Many women have continued to work to, uh, through this without us fully understanding how the female body is perhaps being impacted and triggered differently. <laughs> I, I completely I completely agree with that, Barka. And I think that one of the, the issues that we faced as as women is that <laughs> we we always try to get on with it, right? We have a period, we think, okay, we'll just go to work, it will be fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. um I was pregnant and I was suffering from 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 pregnancy sickness. And there were times, Barka, where I was vomiting inside my mask. And that happened, but I carried Vomit on. Vomit like inside your mask as a yeah. six month pregnant woman with that beautiful Radhika who was then not born. Yeah, Barka, can you just give me one second? Sure. Okay. <laughs> this is this is actually what uh, you know. Young parents go through; they juggle a thousand things. You're seeing on your screen, Dr. Minal Viz, who took her fight for the rights of. Uh, of, of women, especially pregnant women, to get better safety protection, just had uh, her baby. And I think she's had to put Radhika away so that she can uh, talk through it. But but bring her back towards the end of the conversation. We'd love, we'd love well, her to be able to say bye to her. But go ahead. You, you wanted to make yeah. the point about how, and you're absolutely right. We have that, this attitude, and it's a good attitude. Let's just get on with it. Let's just get the job done. But you were speaking about that time when, as a six-month pregnant mother, you were vomiting inside your mask. 
That's right, Berka. And, and I completely agree with you. This is, our, I would say, our, our superpower that we always try to, to just plow ahead. And I, I feel like that's also a narrative we have in our societies and our communities as well. Um, you know, just just keep going. It'll, it will be OK. And that's what I thought as well. And I couldn't think about myself at that time, Berka. I mean, Nurse Mary had passed away at that time. So many of my healthcare mm-hmm. workers had passed away. I couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't have it in me to complain about vomiting inside a mask. You just have to get on with it. And and it's true. That's the reality. And in fact, right now with this peak that we're seeing in the UK, it's much, much worse. But when I was feeling unwell, when I was feeling sick, when I was worried about, about Radhika, why did I have to escalate to the very, very top? That's the question. Yeah. Why did nobody yeah. think about this before? They had plenty yeah. of time. Yeah. They had plenty of time. They knew the virus was coming to this country. They knew what was going to happen. Why didn't they say, well, how can how can we protect pregnant doctors? How can we protect the female population? And that's what bothered me the most, Barca, is that despite escalating, despite going to my managers, and then my managers telling me that I cannot speak to the media, my managers silencing me when I was raising concern, concerns about my unborn child. Why, why did the manager say that? Why did the manager tell you you couldn't speak to the media, you couldn't go to the media? Why? Well, the question is, Burke, if anybody silences you, you have to ask why, right? And yeah. the yeah. obvious answer to me was, what are you trying to hide? This yeah. was my personal yeah. experience. This is what I experienced during COVID. Nobody is allowed to rewrite that. Nobody is allowed to tell me what to say. Sure. And that's what bothered me the most, is that Nurse, Nurse Mary probably did try to escalate her concerns. But she was probably afraid that, well, if she speaks up, what's going to happen to her job? What's going to happen to her family? I had yeah. that fear as well, Barca. Mm-hmm. I knew that there was a chance that I could lose my job. My husband, yeah. Nishant, who also spoke up, knew that he could lose his job. But then we always went back to the very same question, which is, what is the truth? And yeah. we had to make sure that that came out. But it must have been uh, harrowing, right? I mean, Radhika wasn't born. Uh, it was an uncertain time. It, it could have been become an uncertain time economically, yeah. apart from being an uncertain time in all other ways, if you had lost your jobs. But you were still determined to fight that fight. When you stood outside Downing Street, this young woman in her scrubs alone, that photograph went viral. But it, you could just have, just as easily have been ignored, just as easily have been one more person standing on the streets of London protesting about something. You're absolutely right, Barka. Uh, I wasn't sure what the reaction would be when when this happened. In fact, before I went out to protest, nobody in my family knew I was pregnant except for my parents. So as, a, as an Indian woman, as a Desi woman, you think, well, what happens if my family find out? Is this the way for them to find out? And it's, it's shocking to me that this was at the forefront of my worries. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have been worried this that is, I, this, right? is hardwi- um, this is basically hardwired. This is basically hardwiring. There's no yeah. escaping it, right? Yeah. And I, I was yeah. worried that my family would find out. What do I say? So, before the protest, instead of trying to get into that headspace and just trying to make sure that I was completely mentally ready, and remember, Barca, I was re- ready to get arrested. That was the worst case scenario. My husband and I had prepared for all all this, the different things that could have happened to me. I, I called my parents up the day before and I said, look, this is what I'm going to go out to do. And well, if you support me, great. If you don't, I'm still going to go out and do it because I know this is the right thing. And the first thing my parents said, well, yeah, OK, I kind of understand what you're trying to do. But look, <laughs> what are people going to say you're pregnant? You should be sat at home. It's not safe. It, it's, it's not safe to go out. And this is that one thing that stops so many of us. Yeah. This is that one thing that, well, what are people going to say about us? And actually, that shouldn't matter, Barker. Because if you know in your heart what's right, then that's what you need to do. And I go back to Nurse Mary all the time, Barker, because her story reminds me a bit of my own father's story. My father was born in Delhi, in a, in a very small part of Lachmanagar. And one of, one of the things we always used to do when we went to India, he'd always take me to center markets. And there was a specific store where he, he would take us and say, look, Meenal, at the age of 11, I was selling candy over here and desperate for money. And he was abused. People, people uh, really took advantage of him. But no one was there to stand up for him. He came to Europe to, to start a better life. He must have faced so much. But nobody stood up and said, actually, this is not right. No one was there to be there for him. And one thing my dad always said to me is, Meenal, there's no such thing as an innocent bystander. And that's one thing that was always resonating in my head when I was yeah. trying to fight for Mary, when I was trying to fight for the justice for all of these families who lost their loved ones in such a needless and, and such a senseless way, that was that one thing that was ringing in my head. 
Tell us a little bit about your parents. How did they come to leave India? What were their early years like? How did you come to be uh, a doctor? Well, my as I said, my father was from a very small part of Delhi. Um, he was one of those uh, stars in the family who became a chartered accountant. So he was he was very qualified. My mother was the first woman in her family to to get an education and to get a degree. Uh, she's a professor in geography, but they left all of that behind and they came to to Europe just to start a, a better life for 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 Akil and I, my brother. And one thing that was always uh, you know put put into our values was. The, the, the term seva, which is to help people and to help community. And yes, we can do it on a daily basis, right, Berka? I can go out, I can see a homeless guy, I can give him some food. And I've done I've done a few parts to help the world and make it a better place where I can. And these are the values that my parents kept putting into us every single day. But when all of this had happened, Berka, I said, I, I and this is what I repeated to my parents, which is like, well, this is what you taught us. It is scary to go out there it's something that nobody in my family has ever done. Yeah. It's it, and, and in fact, a part of us was scared that what happens if Milo gets kicked out of the country? These are the fears that we have as as people who are coming from India to to Europe. That if we even speak out of line, we might get kicked out. And yeah. we we talk, we talk we talk about standing up for what we believe in and uh, uh, empowerment. And my mother and my father went through so much in their life that I feel that it it wouldn't be right to actually stand up for people like them in a similar position to them. Fantastic. But talk talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the great unknown when it comes to pregnant women and COVID. Uh, now, here's what I have understood from, again, reporting this story extensively. The good news is that that mothers don't actually pass on the virus, even if they're COVID positive to their, to their children, uh, you know, in terms of through their bodies. There's no danger of that. But uh, I was talking to a doctor uh, who actually works in a labor ward, and she said that actually there is no concept of distancing when you're trying to help a woman deliver a child. It's she, I think she said it's like Russian roulette, right? So I just want you to, one, you know, speak about pregnancy from all dimensions. The doctor working in the labor ward, the pregnant doctor at the front line, the pregnant nurse at the front line, and the pregnant mother uh, who's going into a hospital and has to do a COVID test, and all of it. Is this that very big unknown space? Even for the vaccines right now, they're advising that pregnant women should not take the vaccine. I think, Barka, that just as everything else we've seen in the last few years, women and pregnant women especially have been put on the back burner. Yeah. And I've been quite lucky in the sense that I've managed to experience different facets of pregnancy. I've been pregnant. Uh, uh, I've been on the front line. I've had my baby. I'm breastfeeding. And we are still in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah. I was going into clinics. I was getting scans done. And I was all by myself. My husband wasn't there to hold my hand. We weren't there to, to celebrate uh, the scans that we were seeing. And these are moments of joy that we were hoping to yeah. have. So it was... It was very strange, Barker, because we weren't allowed to, to bring our partners into the hospital, but all the pubs were open and people were drinking beer down the road. How does that so make that, sense? That made no sense. And when I when Radhika was delivered and Nishant was there for maybe an hour or so, then after that, I was completely left on my own. So imagine that, Barker. I had a C-section. I was almost to the extent I was completely immobile because I was in so much pain. I was trying to figure out what to do with this tiny baby. Yes. And I was all by myself. Yeah. Incredible. And the, the emotional burden that puts on you is, is something that I, I cannot describe. And in fact, Berger, I, I feel like I'm still trying to understand what actually happened uh, because it has been quite traumatic. It has been a very difficult time. Um, and I think it might take some time to actually absorb the, the situation yeah. that we were in. I, mean, I, think, I think it might hit you later. And so what I want to ask you is, I said postpartum depression is a thing, right? It's a thing even without all of this. And then you've been through all of this. You've been through it alone. You've been fighting the fight. My guess is you haven't even had time to process what you went through. You're right, Berka. I haven't had a chance to process everything. Uh, in fact, I didn't even realize that we were in the new year already. I don't know where time has gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've been... We've been trying to enjoy the time with Radhika. She's growing up every day, but it brings me a deep sadness knowing that I'm going, I'm seeing her milestones by myself. 
you know, my parents are not here. Nishan's family is not around to witness these beautiful moments of, of her life where she's growing. And I'm, I'm witnessing all of this by myself. And at the same time, we've also taken the government to court, um, which in fact led us to a very big win, which I will talk about in, in a moment. But, you know, going back to postpartum depression, it's real. And I, I want to make sure that people understand that, that postpartum depression is something we speak about even pre-pandemic. But now in a pandemic, when women are alone, when women are trying to take care of their children and also the burden of trying to protect everybody around them as well, um, that is very difficult. And I just want to, to emphasize that it's okay to speak up and it's okay to talk to someone and say, look, actually, yeah. I'm not feeling great. And I went through it and I'm, I'm being very open about it, Baraka. I really struggled. I didn't know how to deal with a new baby, the, the yeah. pandemic. I was sat at sure. home, I was, I was closed in. It's really tough. And I, I just hope that there are people out there to, to support, uh, not those who, are, who have had a baby, but who are also pregnant as well. Yeah. Now let's speak about what the legal win has actually changed. I know uh, from reading that there is now a panel that will be specifically looking at those who, who hail from minority communities, ethnic, ethnical minorities. But let's first talk about what's changed in the safeguards uh, uh, that are now being applied to the PPEs, the, the personal protective equipment that is being provided to healthcare workers as a result of your fight. Sure. So just to give you a bit of, of, of context, Burka, when we uh, went out to, to set out this legal challenge, at that time, around 200 healthcare workers had died in this country. Uh, a lot of them were from ethnic minority groups. So we wrote a letter to the government to say, these are the things that need to be fixed. And the things that needed to be fixed were essentially more protective gear and high quality protective gear. And we wanted to make sure that those from ethnic minority groups are better protected. It was simple as that. We said, please get back to us in 48 hours. Let's make these changes, lest people will die. It was that simple. Yeah. Marika, it took them six months to get back to us. Wow. And in that Why? time... Why? Like they were just silent in the, in the interim? So during that time, there was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of politics being played. And this is one thing that I learned that us as doctors on the front line, we speak the language of compassion. We speak the language of humanity. This is what we do. But our leaders speak a completely different language. They speak the language of politics. So they were trying to, to evade the questions and they were trying to always use the same term, unprecedented times. It's unprecedented, it's unprecedented. Well, in an unprecedented time, our doctors are dying and our colleagues are dying. So we sent out this letter, they didn't get back to us, it was a lot of back and forward, and then we came to the conclusion that actually, if we go to the High Court, if we go in front of a judge, the judge will say, well, now these changes have been made, what are you doing here? So we made more change outside the court than we would have if we were in court. So essentially what we have done, Barca, is that we've made sure that there is no reuse of masks and no reuse of PPE, because that was a big, big issue. Masks were being reused, aprons were being reused, and that was causing people to get infected. So that is not allowed anymore. That's completely evoked from the guidelines. The second thing is we set up a specific panel for people to evaluate how ethnic minority groups can be better assessed and better placed in the hospital. So every anybody who's from an ethnic minority group, whether from India, whether from different parts of the world, they have to have a risk assessment done. It's mandatory. And the last thing, which is also very important, Baraka, is that we've made sure that not only do they have masks in the hospital and protective gear, it's of high quality because this yeah. is a very highly infectious disease. So mm -hmm. in certain parts of the hospital, a normal mask might not work. You need a high grade mask. And we have made sure that these changes have been put in place because now, as you can see, we are in another peak and we're going to see very difficult times for the healthcare system. And we cannot have our doctors dying. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything you've done. But in the end, I must ask you to step back and talk about the peak that the United Kingdom is witnessing. The mutation actually took place a few months ago, but the surge led to another lockdown. There's a huge debate taking place globally over whether lockdowns are in fact the answer. But talk a little bit about what's happening around you. Uh, are you planning to go back to work anytime soon or with Radhika just born? That's not possible. Uh, what, this phase that you're currently in, how do you see your life and the life of other health workers unfolding? Well, I was hoping to go back to work, Barka. I really was at this time. And I knew that the, the, the NHS needs doctors. They need help. They need their professionals to come in and, and help during this time. 
but I have a small baby at home. Yeah. What happens if I get infected? What happens if I pass it on to my baby? And yeah. these are the things that I have to think about now uh, because a part of me has lost trust. And I'll be very honest, we we have lost faith in, in our government. We have We don't know if we will be protected when we walk through the doors because our leaders are completely oblivious to the realities. And we've seen so much corruption as well. We've seen we've seen them make sure that their friends get richer and that's been their priority. We've, made sh we've seen how our leaders have been passing on contracts to their friends, making sure that they get all the PPE contracts, making sure that the test and trace system, for example, is completely privatized. It's got nothing to do with the NHS. And Barker, you know, one thing that I realized is that when I was when I was doing all of this in, in last year in March and April, my family from India were calling saying, well, how can this happen in the UK? Surely you must be better prepared than countries like India, for example, right? And I said to them, I said, well, the difference is that the corruption still exists here. The only difference is, is that our leaders wear very nice suits and they speak very good English. And that's what that's what fools us into thinking that they know what they're doing. And that was a problem that our leaders were coming out on TV every day telling us that this is what we're going to do. They were over promising and under delivering. How do I know that that's not going to happen again? Sure. I've had my my friends call me from the front line saying that their ambulance is queuing up outside hospitals. My friends are calling me in tears, not knowing what's going to happen the next day. And it puts me in a very difficult position, Barker, because I feel like I have a responsibility to go back and help my patients and help help the system because they need us. But then as a mother, I have to think about my child as well. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, I think even in this how far conversation, I know you'll find a way to do both. Uh, I, 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 I just know that. As soon as you can, you will. I think that's obvious. Uh, you, you fought when no one else was willing to fight. So more power to you. Before we say bye to you, I, I want to just say bye to Radhika as well. So you know, yeah, just of course, of course. Back. Yeah. Hey, Radhika. Hey, Radhika. Hi, Radhika. Say hi. Hello. She's she's protesting in her nappy right now, Barka. So. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a young protester, and like her mother, she's going to be uh, out on the streets yeah. fighting for justice yeah. and truth uh, sometime soon. Dr. Meenal Viz, more power to your elbow, more power to young Radhika. Thank you for fighting the good fight. A pleasure having you on We the Women, our conversations for change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barka. Thank you.